George Costanza. The guy is a lot of things, but look, architect is not one of them. But boy, does he want to pretend to be one. I'm an architect. Oh. I'm an architect. But what does that say about him, and what kind of architect would he really be? What if George Costanza was an architect? I want to figure this out. And look, I had to get serious. I watched and rewatched every episode of Seinfeld. I took lots of notes. I discussed it with colleagues. I researched and I read books. All to piece together the evidence of just what kind of architect Costanza would be, or at least would claim to be. And here are my findings. After compiling everything, I've drawn some what I think are pretty important conclusions, and I'll make my case by offering seven different exhibits. Exhibit number one, the Emmett Building office location. Two, Guggenheim edition. Three, cozy velvet linings. Four, sight lines and privacy. Five, plumbing and bathroom design. Six, bubble bursting. And seven, character of the architect. Through these seven exhibits, I will paint the picture of George Costanza the architect. Exhibit number one. As early as the second episode of Seinfeld, we learn of George's desire to pretend that he's an architect. What do you do? I'm an architect. George has a number of jobs throughout the show with varying degrees of removal from architecture. But at this point early in the show, George works for a real estate transaction services firm. And he meets Jerry just after showing a condo on 48th Street. Hey, listen, thanks again for running over here. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah, sure. I was showing a condo on 48th Street. Real estate agents at least work with buildings that are architecture adjacent. George tours buildings, matching units with potential buyers. As a seller's agent, he might be recording information about a space, commissioning photography, or at least writing descriptions of it. So the pretend jump to architecture isn't so much of a stretch. Through an establishing shot, we see that we're meeting in this building. I'll put it up on the screen. This building is called the Emmett Building in the Nomad neighborhood of New York. I searched all of Google Street View in order to find it. Notably, this building houses the Vitra showroom in New York, and Vitra is a high-end Swiss furniture company. Jerry and George need a reason to be hanging out in the lobby as an excuse for staging an encounter with a woman that Seinfeld has a crush on. George offers a solution that he works in this building as an architect. The Emmett Building would be a plausible location for an architecture firm based on a number of different factors. You know, given the building's prominent location and size, we can speculate that the firm would be a mid-sized corporate firm. The spaces aren't very large, and it's unlikely that the firm takes up multiple floors of this type of building. The lease rates are around $75 a square foot, so they must be particularly successful in a way that only corporate offices could be able to afford this type of space. And this is also in line with the fact that George probably isn't a star architect or other singularly heroic architect figure. Jerry follows up by saying that he doesn't see architecture coming from George. I don't see architecture coming from you. <laughs> and this is likely due to his personality and lack of character or talents, but Jerry look, did look him up and down, which leads me to believe that there's something about his look that Jerry finds incongruous with the profession. But of course, architects come in all different packages. George's proportion do remind me of a drawing by the late Stanley Tigerman, which is a self-portrait drawing depicting his portly stature within the configuration of the Vitruvian man. And he compares himself to the proportions of a cafe latte and a stir stick. If I want a cafe latte, you give me a cafe latte. When approached by the woman they were waiting to see, George blurts out that he's an architect, even before she asked. <laughs> I'm a... Uh... I'm an architect. Of course, we'll get to the persona of the architect in Exhibit 7, but it's worth mentioning that to claim to be an architect without a license is a misdemeanor, punishable by a fine of not less than $100 and not more than $5,000, or by imprisonment in a county jail not exceeding one year, or by both fine and imprisonment. The term architect is closely protected under the law. Exhibit number two. In the 1994 episode of The Race, George again introduces himself as an architect. I'm an architect. So at this point, he's probably swimming in a few fines, possibly jail time if he was discovered. But this time he has an answer to the follow-up question of what he's designed. And thinking quickly on his feet, he was able to answer that he had done the addition of the Guggenheim Museum. Have you designed any buildings in New York? Have you seen the uh, new addition to the Guggenheim? <laughs> which had only been completed a few years before the airing of this episode. And to add to his mystique, he mentions that it didn't take him very long. It didn't take very long either. Of course, anyone living in New York in the late 80s, early 90s would have been familiar with the saga of the Guggenheim edition. It certainly did take a while, as one would expect when they're trying to alter one of the most important pieces of architecture in the 20th century. The firm that did carry out the design was Guathami Siegel & Associate, and their task was to add new galleries to the iconic building that was only 25 years after its initial completion. The firm spent years studying different alternatives, from underground galleries which proved too costly and inflexible, to failed designs that tried to complement the object of the round building with another floating, hulking object. 
Protesters marched outside of the building as resistance to the addition, and the neighborhood even hired their own architect to make an alternative proposal. Finally, Guathmi Siegel proposed a revised design that worked more like a backdrop to the original building rather than competing with it, and the critics and the public were pleased. Of course, George probably isn't pretending to be one of the firm's two principals, Charles Guathme or Robert Siegel. George would likely be need to be a consultant or employee of the firm. The principal, Charles Guathme, was famous for building an iconic house for his parents right out of grad school, before he was even licensed. Either way, Guathme Siegel was an important firm exploring what postmodernism might mean for architecture. They were part of a group called the New York Five, attributed with a number of important thought and work that advanced the movement. So, so far, we know that George works as a mid-sized corporate firm and is at least sympathetic to postmodern architecture. Exhibit 3. In the 1995 episode The Label Maker, George discusses his fondness for feeling cozy and his dream of draping himself in velvet. I gotta find a way to work this out. I love that apartment. It's so cozy. I'm ensconced in velvet. His desire for coziness will come up later, but I'm reminded of Walter Benjamin's description of domestic spaces of the 19th century. He talks about how people during that time were obsessed with coziness and made velvet cases for everything. Benjamin writes, On the one hand, there is something age-old, perhaps eternal, to be recognized here, the image of the abode of the human being in the maternal womb. The 19th century, like no other century, was addicted to dwelling, though, and it conceived the residence as a receptacle for the person, and it encased him or her with all his protuberances so deeply in the dwelling's interior that one might be reminded of the inside of a compass case, where the installment of all its accessories lies embedded in deep, usually violet folds of velvet. What didn't the 19th century invent some sort of case for? Pocket watches, slippers, egg cups, thermometers, playing cards, and in lieu of cases, there were jackets, carpets, wrappers, and even covers. George would have been at home in the 19th century. Exhibit number four. In the 1997 episode of The Nap, George is probably the closest that he ever gets to being an architect when he imagines the desk of his office as a place for napping. He hires a contractor to modify his furniture for multiple uses by installing a shelf to hold cups and a hidden compartment for an alarm clock and other accoutrements. A little shelf, like, uh, for an alarm clock? <laughs> what about, maybe that big? No, no, maybe like this. Like that? Yeah, like that. Some people might call this kind of thinking ad hocism, which is a theory by Charles Jenks, using materials at hand to solve problems. Here he's bringing two opposites together, an object of work, the desk, and an object of leisure, the bed. And Charles Jenks argues that this is the epitome of creativity. And it should be noted that George gets annoyed when the contractor asks too many questions. You want this cup holder, uh, you want it mounted on the left, or the right, or in the middle? Whatever. <laughs> He'd prefer him to have more autonomy to use his judgment to make decisions. Clearly, George thinks of his design more of a conceptual intellectual act and not the act of making or working with one's hands. The use in the design of the desk shows an astute and precise use of sight lines and viewing angles. So when George is asleep, people are looking in from the hallway, but they cannot see George. Also, when George Steinbrenner comes in looking for him and sits down, he has no awareness that George is sleeping underneath the desk. Costanza, where's Costanza? <laughs> However, at the same time, George is able to peer out from underneath the, the desk to surveil the scene. Oh, he was humming this song yesterday. I can't seem to get it out of my head. And this puts George in control of the space because he can observe others while not being observed himself. Exhibit number five. This close attention to privacy, coziness, and viewing angles is also seen in his appreciation for bathroom design. George uses personal priorities to develop a personal mental map of the city. Anywhere in the city. Anywhere in the city, I'll tell you the best public toilet. <laughs> okay, 54th and 6th. Sperry Rand Building, 14th floor, Morgan Apparel. Also like the psychogeographic maps of the situationists like Constant that would take derives or aimless walks around the city and record how the city came to them. Apparently, Alice Tully Hall has magnificent facilities and figures strongly inside of George's mental map. Lincoln Center, Alice Tully Hall, the Met. Magnificent facilities. I'm assuming this is probably before the Diller and Scafinio renovation. This love of bathroom also translates into an understanding of the principles of plumbing. I George says that all drain pipes go to the same place, which is usually true. However, sometimes the difference between gray water, like that of the shower, or black water, like that coming from the toilet, could go to different places. Sometimes buildings have gray water storage tanks that can be used elsewhere, like irrigating plants and things like that, but probably not in the context of New York. 
Exhibit number six. So George understands plumbing, but doesn't overly celebrate it. He's certainly not someone interested in high-tech architecture like Richard Rogers, who would put plumbing on the exterior of the building to showcase it. In fact, George engages in a symbolic act of aggression toward this kind of high-tech architecture when he literally bursts the bubble of Bubble Boy. <laughs> Obviously, the bubble is reminiscent of various architectural technological experiments in providing minimal enclosure while providing thermal comfort, like Archigram's Cushicle or Rainer Banham's Environment Bubble. Even that thing is higher than architect. I think I'd really like to be a city planner. Why limit myself to one building when I can design a whole city? Exhibit number seven. George believes that city planners aren't as good as architects, which I agree with. Which brings us to a most important point, that George is enamored with the image of the persona of the architect. He may not dress like one or carry the tools of the architect, even though he does know what a T-square is. Well, isn't an architect <laughs> just an art school dropout with a tilting desk and a big ruler? <laughs> it's called a T-square. Instead, he wants people to think he's an architect. He's interested in the architect as a symbol of certain traits and outward social cultural prestige. Jimmy Carter, not that Jimmy Carter, wrote an essay called The Construction of an Architect, where he examined how architects are used as characters in various media like TV, film, and even painting. He uses examples like Henry Fonda's character in 12 Angry Men as a good example of this. And in this film, he's never seen doing architecture. Rather, the stereotype of the traits are used to help provide the story with a person that has aptitude and influence. He, the architect, is able to remain objective and intelligently parses through the facts, and this is presented against the crudeness of the other characters. He thinks for himself, and he's unswayed by popular opinions and peer pressure. In reality, this is George's obsession, the image of the architect. Not the image of the round spectacles and bow ties, but the architect as this cultural figure. Nothing is more postmodern than severing the divide between the image of something and their function. So, George is a cozy loving, anti technology, corporate pomo architect. If you agree, or even if you don't agree, go ahead and give this uh, video a like. And if you like to watch some videos on some real architects, choose from one of the ones that are up here, like the one on Mies van der Rohe. Or if you're into videos about architecture and media, go ahead and watch my breakdown of Westworld Season 1. See you over there.